By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Now, faith brought about a powerful miracle here. It was physically impossible for Abraham and Sarah to have a baby. Yet that's what God promised, that Abraham would have seed. In fact, if you go back to the book of Genesis, and you don't need to do that, when uh, the, uh, Moses describes Sarah, he says Sarah was barren. And that word means sterile. It wasn't that she didn't have children. It was she couldn't have children. Uh, she was barren. And, and, and the Hebrew is akar, and literally means to be sterile. Uh, yet God came to them and said, I'm going to raise up seed, a whole nation from you. Sarah's going to have a baby. Immediately, Abraham laughed for joy. But the scripture says that Sarah had a different kind of laugh, of almost a, a laugh of ridicule, of incredulu incredulous laugh. Uh, she was saying, I can't have a baby. This is ridiculous. Uh, Sherry and I are more than 20 years younger than Abraham and Sarah. And I can remember we mentioned in prayer uh, prompter once that Sherry, S-H-A-R-I, Wilhite, was going to have a baby. 
by the context of whether it is male, female, he, she, etc. But the very fact that the word is laying down seed points to the fact that it should be male. And, and so even though it could go either way, or all three ways, it, is, it, it would be better to translate it this way. When he was a past age, because he judged God to be faithful, who had promised. Now, whose faith then are we talking about here? We're talking about Abraham's faith. But you say, Pastor Mike, Sarah's name is mentioned. Exactly. What's that got to do with it? Well, it's really great. Because the Greek language is a language that has certain cases. There is the nominative, ablative, the possessive, uh, the genitive, the dative, the accusative. And they, they all have special endings and so on. Well, Sarah is in the dative form. That's not the subject form. It's a dative form. And it's what the linguists call a dative of accompaniment. Are you all asleep yet? <laughs> uh, but what that means is that she accompanied Abraham in this action. A and she was a willing participant. And I don't need to get graphic about that, but you understand that she willingly was obviously necessary and she was obviously a willing participant. So what I'm saying is that she willingly became part of Abraham's faith. And, and when Abraham believed that God could do it, Sarah partic participated in that. Does that make sense at all? And, and, and so, and, and God gave him the power to do that. God gave Abraham the power to have children, to lay down seed. In fact, even after Sarah died, he still had power because he married a, a, a woman by the name of um, uh, Keturah and had six more kids. Uh, and, and so God energized him so he could lay down seed. Now, I think there's a very personal application here about Sarah's faith, and that is it was an accompanied faith to her husband. And, and so, ladies, I think it's really important that you see that Sarah was a willing participant. Now, both Abraham and Sarah stub, stumbled in their faith with Hagar. Uh, the writer of Hebrews chose not to deal with that, and that's fine, because by and large, they were both people of faith. But ladies, I think that it's really remarkable when you accompany your husband in faith. I, I, I think that's what Sarah did. Learn from Sarah. I, I shared with you last time we were in this chapter about how when God uh, directed me to go to Dallas Theological Seminary, I came and sat down beside Sherry at the banquet and said, what do you think of going to Dallas? And her response was, if that's where God wants you, I go where you go. And, and so far, she's stuck by that. <laughs> uh, even when we got a puppy, uh, you know. And, and uh, Sherry's faith is great. But it is a faith that has accompanied me as her husband. And I'm so very thankful for her. Uh, I'm so very thankful. The faith in this chapter, then, isn't Sarah's only it was the two of them combined. Now, therefore, when you look at verse 12, it makes more sense in the reading. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants, as many as the stars of the heaven, as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Abraham had children upon children, and the whole nation of Israel. And, and God is powerful. Uh, you say, wait a minute, can we make that same kind of claim? I want to have children and I haven't had children. God didn't promise you that. Uh, that may be God's will, it may not. But the thing is, God is powerful and we need to recognize that. You remember how the disciples could not uh, cast out demons? 
And, and, and Jesus said, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Uh, uh, and Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to them that believe. Uh, Luke eight twenty seven. Jesus says the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. I think of Matthew seventeen nineteen. Then came the disciples privately and said, "Why can't we cast demons out?" And Jesus said, "Because of your unbelief." But I say unto you, if you uh, have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, uh, you can make that mountain move. Uh, and and, and I think of the story of a lady who had a mountain in her backyard and she prayed all night that the mountain would be gone and she got up the next morning, it was there, and she said, I knew it wouldn't happen. You know, that's not a prayer of faith. Uh, and I, I'll admit, this is something I struggle with. Have you prayed for the miraculous and really believed it? Uh, I struggle sometimes with that. I struggle with praying for the miraculous. But Paul says in Philippians 4.13, I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you believe that, beloved? Uh, Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or even think according to the power that works in us. Not our power, but his power. There are so many needs in our life. There are so many needs in First Baptist Church. And, and are we really claiming God to do the things that we just can't see happen in a human realm? The Bible says, is anything too hard for God? Test him and see. Uh, it, it really does shame me when I say I believe and, and I do, but there are times when I, oh, I really wonder if God's going to do that. You ever feel that way? I do. I struggle with that sometimes. Uh, we need to remember the power of our faith. And we could spend a whole lot of time about that, uh, but we need to move on. Not only is faith powerful, but faith is positive. This is in verses 13 through 16. Uh, verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. All of these guys, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they never saw the fulfillment of the, the land blessing of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, verse 13 says, these all died in faith. Uh, they died believing in spite of the fact that they hadn't attained it yet, not having received the promise. Uh, in, in other words, they were positive about the promise even though they had not inherited all of that promise yet. They were looking at it from another opportunity. They were looking at it as pilgrims, as strangers, as exiles. Um, verse 14 and says, 15 says they weren't looking back, they were looking forward. Uh, but as it is, they desire a better country, even more than the promised land. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. They looked for a better place. Not going back to uh, Chaldea, uh, they were looking for a heavenly one. That was the positive thing about their faith. Isn't it wonderful when we have a loved one? Todd shared with us that he had an uncle passed away. We need to pray for them as they grieve. Uh, but isn't it wonderful that we do not grieve as those who have no hope? It doesn't say we don't grieve. But we grieve as those who have hope. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing my little brother again. I'm looking forward to seeing Lee Norris again. I'm looking forward to seeing Grace and Raymond again. And on and on we could go. I'm looking forward to seeing loved ones that are in heaven, aren't you? So we're just strangers. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, that word it, it was used in Sparta uh, as, to mean a barbarian. They, they just had no rights. They were refugees, uh, were, were seen as pilgrims. And, and uh, again, this world is not our foundation. Are you sure about heaven? That's the positiveness of faith. We have a place we're going to that's better than this place, praise God. That's the positive of heaven. I know heaven is real. I know that because God said so. And I'm looking forward to it. I don't know what it's all about. Don't know very little what it's like. But I know it'll be something, don't you? Uh, it'll really be something. The psalmist says, One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Can you imagine living in God's house for the rest of your life? Won't that be something? Uh, and, and even Job said, uh, Even though the, the worms destroy my body, I will see God. I will see God. The apostle said, it's nice to be around you people. I like you a lot, but it's far better to be with Christ. Uh, these guys weren't looking back to Chaldea. They, they weren't even looking just to the promised land. They were looking to the one who promised the land. And that's very, very important. And then what was the response? Verse 16 says, wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Oh, man, did you hear that? God wasn't ashamed to be called their God. I, I can't imagine God saying, Mike, I'm not ashamed to be called your God. I think that has something to do with the way we live, don't you? I'm not ashamed to call you my child. Why? Because you're living like my child. Beloved, you and I, need to live a way that will make it so that God can truthfully say, I'm not ashamed to be Dar's God or Cal's God or, or Mary's God or Brandon's God or Elizabeth's God or Joel's God. I'm not ashamed to be Grant's God. Why? Because we're living a life that brings glory to God. Amen? And... and and so Abraham has this recipe for faith. It is a pilgrimage. It is patience. It is positive. It is powerful. And then finally, it is proof. Uh, faith is proof of what you believe. Verse 17, 18. Uh, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up. This whole story is in Genesis 22, verses 1 through 18. You know the story. God said to uh, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac up, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine Abraham telling Isaac, get up, we're going up to the mountain, we're going to sacrifice to God? And, and he gets there and says, Father... And he's, Abraham said this, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And the Hebrew is very expressive. It doesn't mean that God will himself provide a sacrifice. It means that God will provide himself a sacrifice. You get it? And who was that sacrifice? Jesus Christ, right? And you know the story. Uh, Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. Why? Verse 19. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did raise him from the dead. And in other words, he didn't really die. Somebody took his place. And that's important because you and I don't die spiritually because someone took our place, and that someone is Jesus Christ our Lord. And... and and, you know, Abraham knew that even though he would sacrifice his son, God would keep his promise. Uh, what is the final proof then of faith? It is the willingness to sacrifice. I think of John Bunyan. Uh, 
who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, he was in jail and he was concerned in jail for his faith. And he was concerned especially for his uh, little blind daughter. And he wrote this. Oh, I saw in this condition, I was a man who was pulling down his house upon the head of his wife and children. And yet I thought I must do it. I must do it. In other words, I must stand for the faith. The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. Listen, we believe in family here at First Baptist Church, but we also believe that family cannot take the place of our God. Amen? Uh, we, we love families here, and, and not to degrade families at all. But you know what? You and I aren't called to sacrifice our children like Isaac, uh, Abraham was called to sacrifice Isaac. And of course, you know Isaac was a willing participant. He was a young man. Abraham didn't wrestle him onto the throne. And, and in a sense, Isaac helps us to understand what Paul is saying in Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable. The proof of your faith is to be a living sacrifice. And the problem with a living sacrifice is when the heat is on, you want to crawl up the altar because the heat is on. I've told the story before, and you may already remember it, but my dad was a, a cook at a restaurant that served live lobster. Well, I mean, they cooked them, but they had a live lobster tank. And a dish boy wanted to become a chef. And he asked dad, how do you cook lobster? And my dad, being the kind of guy he was, said, you throw them into the pizza oven. And so this guy reached in the tank, threw into the big open pizza oven the lobster. And you know what happened? That lobster started making his way to the front. And he says, what do you do? And he said, that's what those wood pizza paddles are for. And he kept banging that lobster back in the oven. Why? Because a living sacrifice has the tendency to crawl off the altar when the heat is on. And God says, when the heat is on, you are to be a living sacrifice. Why? To prove that God's will is good that God's will is pleasing, and that God's will is the best deal in town. You and I are not going around looking like we've been baptized in pickle juice. We are to be a living sacrifice, but we're not to go around, ooh, 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 I'm a sacrifice. We are to prove that God is good, that God is pleasing that his will is the best deal in town. That's what we're to do. And so biblical faith is a pilgrimage separated from the world. It is patient, waiting for God's work to be fulfilled and God's word to be fulfilled. It is power, believing that God can do the impossible. It is positive, Focusing on eternity rather than the stuff around us. And it is a proof of obedience by living, being a living sacrifice. In Abraham, we see God's recipe for a biblical faith. That pattern is what you and I should follow. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that we've been able to share together again this, these great principles as seen in the life of Abraham. I, I pray that you'll help us all to conform our hearts to what we have learned. Encourage us to live by faith in Jesus' name as living sacrifices, proving that your will is good and pleasing and the best deal ever. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen.